Okay, good morning again. Kind of an odd one today. Um, we're going to introduce L'Hopital's rule, which has several alternate spellings. This is how I learned to spell it back in the day. I'm maybe with a capital H. And I said, this is kind of an oddity. It doesn't uh, fit in with the last section. It doesn't fit into the next section. L'Hopital's rule is a limit finding rule. It's the only limit finding rule we're going to learn in calculus two. We could have learned it towards the end of calculus one. I think it traditionally gets taught just because we're going to need it when we get to chapter 10. So the philosophy of not giving students a chance to forget it between calculus one and calculus two. So if you're taking a limit, as x approaches something of a fraction, then if all goes well, the limit of the fraction is going to be the fraction of the limit. And I uh, let me write this down because it's kind of central to what we're going to do today. If all goes well. So for example, like this. Zoom a bit here, there we go. For example, the limit as x approaches five of x squared plus three over x minus two. There aren't any problems here. I mean, taking the limits can be done using continuity. You just stick five in there, and you get a fraction, 28 over three, no sweat. Compare that to the limit as x approaches two of x x minus two over x squared plus four. This limit doesn't exist. And the fact that this limit doesn't exist is reflected in what happens if you try to use this rule. We get eight over zero, and then we cannot divide by zero. So but compare that to the limit as x approaches zero of the sign of x divided by x. Again, all does not to go well, as it were. You get a division by zero error. You get zero divided by zero. In fact, if you'll indulge me, 
And let me put a three in front of that sign. Well, we still get zero divided by zero. So division by zero error, division by zero error. This limit doesn't exist. This limit does exist. And we talked about it briefly in, in Calculus 1, but um, I certainly don't expect anyone to remember it. 3 times the sine of x divided by x. Am I sharing this? I am. So this isn't defined at zero. We get a division by zero error. But this limit, graphically, looks like it's three, in the sense that as x gets closer and closer to zero, y is getting closer and closer to three. And that's what a limit is. So this limit is three, even though we get a division by zero error. Um, just a pedagogical note. The reason I put the three in front of the sign is that without that three, the limit would be one. And I didn't want any to risk anybody thinking that the reason it's one is that those zeros are canceling each other out. Um, this limit exists, it's equal to three. Something is going on here. So, so again, in calculus one, we learned a few tricks. And again, I don't know how well you'd remember these. They're not the most important things in calculus one, but like taking limits of rational functions by factoring them and canceling them or dealing with square roots. Um, by flipping subtraction into addition, that whole thing. A limit as an indeterminate bull. Worm. Well, there are actually multiple indeterminate forms, most of which we're not going to talk about just for time reasons. But the indeterminate forms we're interested in, if it is a fraction that becomes zero over zero or infinity over infinity when you would try to use The quotient rule. And when I use the phrase quotient rule, there are a few things that we've called the quotient rule over the course of calculus one. Like we have a quotient rule for derivatives, but I, of course, I'm referring to that. So this is not indeterminate. Any number 
but zero divided by zero such a limit does not exist. This is indeterminate. The top and the bottom both go to zero. And the phrase indeterminate, I mean, it's because knowing that this is a zero over zero is not enough to determine what the limit is going to be. The limit as x goes to zero of two times the sine of x over x is two. This is also zero over zero. So you see zero over zero, the limit can be different things. Again, we cannot determine what the limit is just by the fact that we get to zero over zero, hence indeterminate. Infinity over infinity, That form most commonly shows up when you're taking a limit as x goes to infinity. So you could take the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over e to the x. Well, as x goes to infinity, you see x squared shoots up, x squared goes up to infinity, and you see e to the x shoots up e to the x goes to infinity as x gets big. So what about x squared over e to the x? Well, it's infinity over infinity. Just like with that sine thing, we can figure this out with a quick graph. x squared over e to the x. Um, this crater, it's uh, craters down to zero. It goes up for just a moment. And then as X gets big, this very quickly goes to zero. And this is, let me graph setting as like, if Y were between, zero and one, yeah, we can really see this. It just goes to zero. It's not literally zero here, that's a rounding thing, but the limit is clear from looking at the graph. On the other hand, and the reason this is called indeterminate, if we flip those around, we still have infinity over infinity. But this graph is going to do something totally different. Instead of going to zero, this thing, I don't know how well you can actually see it. Maybe if I remove the axes, it will be a little more visible. As X gets big, this thing just shoots up to infinity. So this limit does not exist. We can 
write that it equals infinity. So again, the fact that we have infinity over infinity is not enough to determine what this limit is. It's not even enough to determine if the limit exists. One of these limits exists, the other limit doesn't. So L'Hopital's rule is a trick for trying to find the limits of indeterminate forms. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. What L'Hopital's rule says is well, first of all, you need an indeterminate form. Zero over zero, infinity over infinity. I hate to use this word because I'm not trying to trick students per se, and I want everyone to ace all the tests, but I always get in inverted quoted quotation marks, students on tests because I ask them to find limits and sometimes they need L'Hopital's rule, sometimes they're in an indeterminate form, and other times they're not. And if you use L'Hopital's rule and it's not in an indeterminate form, you'll get the wrong answer. So the first thing we need to do is check that we really do have one of those forms, zero over zero or infinity over infinity. And if we do, L'Hopital's rule says, not the limit as x approaches zero specifically, sorry. X can approach anything, a finite number, an infinite number. But L'Hopital's rule says that if you take the derivative of the top and the bottom, it doesn't change the limit. I feel like I must have seen L'Hopital's rule proven at some point in my life, but I couldn't really tell you at this point why this is true. I can just tell you it is true. So let's try, well, let's try one of the problems we looked at before. This limit we got by looking at a graph. The limit as x goes to zero of three times the sine of x over x. This is indeterminate. Um, at the bottom, I mean, if you plug x in for, if you plug zero in for x, that's zero. That's probably pretty evident. You, hopefully remember or can think about the unit circle for a bit. The sine of zero is zero. So it's zero over zero. Because this is indeterminate, we can try L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of x is one, The derivative of the sine of x is the cosine of x. And what happens now if we try to take the limit by sticking zero in? 
Well, the cosine of zero is one. And three divided by one is three. So L'Hopital's rule tells us that this limit is three, which of course is precisely what we got um, when we graphed the thing. And at this point, let's just do a few more examples. We don't have a lot of super edifying stuff to say. Let's do one minus cosine X. over x plus x squared as x approaches zero. And again, we're not going to just blunder in and use L'Hopital's rule because L'Hopital's rule requires an indeterminate form. We have to make sure that we either have zero over zero or infinity over infinity. And we do. We have zero over zero. So we can hit this with L'Hopital's rule. Sometimes you see, I've never done this. Sometimes textbooks will write LH over the E sign just so that their audience isn't left wondering what's going on here. They're using L'Hopital's rule. But let's see. 1 plus 2x. And up here we need to be a little cautious. The derivative of the cosine is the negative sign, but we've got that subtraction. So the derivative is one plus the sine of x. And now let's see what happens when we let x be zero. I mean, I, I guess what I should formally say is everything here is continuous. We're trying to use continuity in, re, in practice. That means we're letting x be zero and seeing what happens. The sine of zero is zero. We get one over one, which is one. So in the uh, in the applications of L'Hopital's rule, when we actually use it for something in this class. It's usually going to be for limits as x goes to infinity. And the indeterminate forms we're interested in are usually going to be infinity over infinity. So we might have to think a little here because we don't actually have a trick for finding most limits as x goes to infinity. So what happens as we try to let the top go to infinity? Well, we can probably sort of intuit it. Infinity is infinitely big. If you take something that's infinitely big and square it, that's going to become even bigger somehow. And if you then add 
at another infinity, presumably it becomes even bigger. And in the denominator, um, e to a big number is big. So e to an infinitely big number is infinitely big. And this is indeterminate. So we can attempt L'Hopital's root. And what we're going to see here is a situation that crops up. Which is that we're going to have to use L'Hopital's rule multiple times. So we use it once. We take the derivative of the top and the bottom. Well, the bottom is still infinity and the top is still infinity. I mean, the bottom hasn't changed. In the top, two times infinity is infinity. Infinity plus one is infinity. I mean, that's a somewhat informal way to say it, but I hope it's clear. So we have infinity over infinity still, and we still don't know what this is. It's still indeterminate. Well, because this is indeterminate, we can hit it with L'Hopital's rule again. And now as X goes to infinity, we get two over infinity. This is not one of the two indeterminate forms we've given. We cannot use L'Hopital's rule. In fact, this is a determinate. Four. Any finite number over infinity is equal to zero. So L'Hopital's rule tells us that this limit is zero. Let's see. L'Hopital's rule doesn't always work. I'm trying, let's see if I can remember offhand. I might not be able to. An example where L'Hopital's rule looks like it should work, but doesn't, I think e to the x plus e to the minus x over e to the x will be the example we want. If it isn't, that's fine. We can see L'Hopital's rule succeed. That's fine too. Um, but this is indeterminate. And again, I mean, I'm just looking at this and recognizing this. I understand it might not be so easy if you haven't taught this class a G of n times. E to infinity is infinity. What about E to the negative infinity? Yeah. I heard zero. Thank you. I agree with that. That's just for people who can't see that immediately. Let's just quickly remind ourselves. 
here's what e to the x looks like. So as we're going to the left, as x is going to negative infinity, you see we're hugging the x-axis. We're hugging is zero. So again, this, this is framing it kind of informally, but infinity plus zero is infinity. So we do have infinity over infinity. Down in the bottom, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Nothing interesting there. What's the derivative of e to the x plus e to the minus x? So I don't want to vector people, but after calc one, these are derivatives you should be able to take very quickly. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, so we'll just deal with each of them separately. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Here we have a composition. We've got that e to the x as the outside function, and we've got that negative one times x as the inside function. So we should take the derivative of the outside function, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. But then we should have the derivative of the inside function. And the derivative of negative 1 times x is negative 1. So I've said L'Hopital's rule isn't going to work here. Um, this is not demonstrated yet, but this is still indeterminate. Now, instead of infinity plus zero, we have infinity minus zero, but that's still infinity. So this is indeterminate. We try to hit it with L'Hopital's rule again. Sadly, when we hit it with L'Hopital's rule again, now the negative one we're going to get from here and this negative sign are going to turn into addition. And we're going to get right back to where we were when we started. So using L'Hopital's rule here just gives us an infinite, infinite repetition. We go between these limits and we can't find either of them. So L'Hopital's rule is powerful, but not all powerful. There are limits that you cannot take using it, even though it's even though they are in the indeterminate form, and they're the kind of thing L'Hopital's rule is designed to deal with. Any questions so far? I guess the main thing I have, I mean, have to say, always make sure you've really got an indeterminate 
form um make sure you're taking the derivatives of the top and the bottom separately. We've got quotients here, but we're not using the quotient rule. We're dealing with the top and we're dealing with the bottom as two separate derivatives. Um, nothing special is going to happen here. It's just another example. So as X goes to infinity, Again, this is an informal way of writing this. There are people who would be very upset by it, but infinity squared is infinity. And the natural log of infinity is infinity. Uh, this, maybe we don't all Remember the natural log so well. The natural log looks like this. And the natural log grows. And the natural log grows slowly. I did not mean to do that. Like that step by go up to 10. The natural log, as I say, grows so slowly that if you just look at it, you might wonder if it's not approaching some finite number, if it doesn't have a horizontal asymptote. But that is not the case. It is going to infinity. If you want it to be bigger than 40, for example, you just have to go to your x-axis and start dumping in these zeros. And if we put in enough, we will, we do see it eventually gets above 40. If we then want it to get above 50 or above 100, uh, let's see, 19 zeros, is it? Again, we just keep pumping the zeros, 29 zeros, 39 zeros, 49 zeros gets us above 100. So even though this is growing slowly, it is going up to infinity. And this is an indeterminate form. We can try hitting it with L'Hopital's rule. Even though it's a little tedious, we should uh, maintain good notation and write out to the limit every time we use L'Hopital's rule. The limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x times 2x. Again, if the derivative of the natural log isn't something you have down, um, you should try to find an hour or two to review it because it's a very important derivative. And then let's see, this is no longer indeterminate. The limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x is 0. The limit as x goes to infinity of 2x is infinity. So whatever this is, it's not... Um, indeterminate, 
what can anybody tell me what zero over infinity should be? Just zero. zero. Thank you. So we have two things kind of meeting here. Um, zero over anything but zero is zero. And anything but infinity over infinity is a zero. So both the zero at the top and the infinity at the bottom, they've teamed up to make this thing be a zero. And then take a quick look. Uh, default the, the zoom back to normal was what? The natural log of x over x squared. It says my screen sharing is paused. Hopefully. It's now doing what it should be. So this sort of goes up for a time. That was supposed to be x squared. It goes up for a moment, but then you see it falls back down towards zero. And that's basically Lopatow's rule. I mean, there are a few tricks we could do, but, but in 99 out of 100 cases, when you're using Lopatow's rule, you've got a quotient, and it's either zero, it's an indeterminate quotient, and it's either zero over zero or infinity over infinity, so it's indeterminate and you try Lopatow's rule. As I say, there are kind of tricks. You can occasionally take this, use this to take the derivative of a product or the derivative of a power, but this is the important stuff, so let's stick with that. And um, we will end class. I will see you tomorrow at nine o'clock.